What role does medicinal chemists play in drug research? So let me just give you a very, very crude background of what drug research is about. The drug research typically can be divided into two, two stages. The first one would be what we call a drug discovery. And this is a stage where a compound of interest, which can potentially act as a drug, is identified. The later stage is what we call drug development. And this is a stage where all preclinical and clinical studies for are using animals as well as humans will be carried out. Medicinal chemists are primarily involved in drug discovery stage. In this drug discovery stage, what the medicinal chemists did was to synthesize, purify, characterize, and test a compound. So it's, it's, it's pretty boring, you might say, right? So, but they play an important role in framing the hypothesis of a new drug project. So they have an important role to play. As um, after a heat compound has been identified, a heat compound basically means a compound which is biologically active. It is the medicinal chemist who then decide which part of the molecule should be changed or modified in order to enhance or maximize its activity. And during this fine tuning process, a project may fail. Many of the drugs that we have today exist is due in part to medicinal chemists working tirelessly to solve one problem after another. And over the years, many new approaches in drug discovery has been made. And one of the most significant that I want to share with you is the emergence of biologics. So biologics are genetically engineered products based on living organism. The proposition of using biologics to treat diseases or to cure diseases is a very interesting one. Just imagine curing diseases such as cancer using peptides or proteins, antibodies, or even cells. So very recently, there are researchers who have been using T cells in trying to cure cancer. So T cells is basically a subtype of your white blood cells. What these people did was to harvest the T cells from a patient's body, reprogram it to make it target specifically against tumor cancers, and then put it back into a patient. So this type of technology was unheard of, say, just five years ago. Because previously, in the past, drug discovery is basically dominated by small molecules. So small molecules basically are organic compounds, typically less than 1,000 Dalton. They are very, very small molecules. So in comparison, for example, one strand of your DNA basically is more than a billion Dalton. So small molecules have served us well over the past few decades. Remember your paracetamol or your Panadol or your aspirin? These are all small molecules. So small molecules are very popular because they are easy to manipulate as well as easy to produce. But they have one drawback in the sense that they are selective but they are not specific. So what this means is that there's always a remote chance of these small molecules acting as drugs, interacting with a non-desired target. And this could spell problem later on in a patient in terms of side effects. So on the other hand, biologics are very specific and it acts only on one particular target. And the fact that biologics is based on living organism, it is perceived, it's perceived, but it's not always the case, that it is safer with less side effects. So biologics have come a long way during the past few years. In 2014, six of the top 10 best-selling drugs 
are small molecules. So the trend was reversed in 2015 and 2016, where the number drops down to only two, with the rest dominated by biologics. So we can actually see a changing trend over here in between the popularity of biologics and small molecules, but whether the trend is sustainable is left to be seen. But no matter whether we are talking about biologics or small molecules, it still takes five to six years in terms of drug discovery. And if you, if you include that with drug development, and to bring a drug from the lab bench to clinic, it will still take about 10 to 15 years, and still a very long time. And it's not to mention the success rate, extremely low success rate of just 0.05% on average, coupled with hefty price tag of more than 2.6 billion US dollar. So now we know why sometimes drugs are so expensive. Right? So one of the trends which scientists have been looking at is on how to lower the cost of therapy. The, one of the ways that we could do it is to repurpose old drugs. Basically, what this means is that it's something like a teaching an old dog new tricks. So humans have been repurposing for ages. We have been changing houses into museums. We have been, we have been changing old tires into swings, and so on and so forth. So why not drugs? So repurposing in drug discovery refers to a situation where an approved drug finds another use, which is to treat a different disease. Sir so James Black, a Nobel laureate in medicine, once noted that the best way to find a new drug is to start from an old one. A very wise man in Anybody knows? Viagra? <laughs> right, I can see some guys over there nodding their head, smiling, yeah? Right? So Viagra was originally developed to treat cardiovascular disorders. But along the way, it makes clear sense that it makes a better treatment in treating erectile dysfunction. Right. And it's popular for its later application, that sometimes people tend to forget what it's originally developed for. So this just shows one of the success, successful um, ways of repurposing an old drug. So it makes complete sense to repurpose an old drug because it will only take only, quote and unquote, 300 million US dollar and six and a half years to repurpose an old drug compared to 2.6 billion US dollars, as mentioned just now, or 10 to 15 years to develop a completely new one. Another area which has been receiving a lot of, of um, attention and heavy investment is artificial intelligence. It's kind of like the in thing right now. In the past six months, Three multi-million dollar tie-up between leading pharmaceutical companies and AI service providers has been announced. AI is perceived to be able to increase the chance of success in identifying new therapeutics by helping to predict which molecule has more potential, how it will work, how it will behave, and how likely it is to become a useful drug. So AI is perceived to be able to reduce up to three quarters of the cost of traditional approach by doing away with unnecessary tests. But AI is not something very new in the sense that it has been around in the 1970s or even 1980s. So what makes the difference between the AI in the past and the AI now? So AI now is much more powerful compared to AI 30 to 40 years ago. What actually makes the difference is that they have developed a superior neural networking, which means that AI now is able to learn to perform tasks faster and better without specific 
task programming. And we actually can sense a breakthrough. Some people can actually sense a breakthrough 20 years ago. In 1997, IBM supercomputer, Deep Blue, maybe some of you were not even born, have managed to beat the then world champion Gary Kasparov in a series of chess games. So this result actually shocked quite a number of people. Because at that time, not many of us would think that a machine could actually beat a human brain in terms of critical analysis. But the big question now is that, will AI succeed in drug discovery? Nobody will know. Is anybody scarce? Only time will tell. But what is certain now is that we need more human brains. Drug discovery, as you might know now, is a long and complex journey. And then the best way to attempt this, in my opinion, is to harness the brains of as many scientists as possible. We have amazing people doing great things in very diverse areas, in biology, in chemistry, in nanotechnology, in engineering. So all these people could actually contribute towards the drug discovery effort. The key now is to how to get these people to work in a more collaborative manner, not only within academia, but also within industry. It is heartening to see some symbiotic relationship actually developing between the academic institution as well as the industry. One very good example is the recently announced joint collaboration between Novartis and the University of California, Berkeley. So they have kind of like a joint effort to look into undruggable proteins, which means proteins which are very, very difficult to target. And it is with this type of collaboration that we hope more scientific breakthrough will come. There's also innovative platform by leading pharmaceutical companies such as AstraZeneca, as well as Eli Lilly, who has provided free screening services of compounds to test for activities against target diseases of their interest. So this is especially useful for organizations or institutions which do not have the means or ability to screen for the compounds previously. And not lagging behind, not-for-profit organizations or institutions such as the Wellcome Trust has also played their part. Wellcome Trust, together with the University of Queensland, has jointly established the Community for Open Antimicrobial Drug Discovery, or in short, COADD. So what they did was to have samples from all over the world and to screen these compounds for activities against bacterial pathogens as well as fungi. So there's no doubt that this type of open innovation or strategies can help to push forward the drug discovery effort. And we are looking forward for more to come. Right? So this is exciting times for drug discovery. What I've mentioned during the past 15 or 20 minutes is just the tip of the iceberg. Although much is needed to be done, but we have made Phenomenal progress in the last decade. Look at the progress we have in HIV, in neurology, in oncology, in drug, in, in drug delivery, in diagnostic, in personalized medicine. So all these are amazing things. And using tools and data from newly emerging fields, for example, genomics, proteomics, next generation sequencing, machine learning, I am very confident that the next decade of drug discovery will be equally astounding. Our ability to create new and better drugs will increase very, very dramatically. So to all those young researchers, especially in drug discovery, this is your time. Do your part to help translate science into medicine. Step up, go out, and make a difference. Thank you.